About 13 years ago, when I was 26, the day after my 26th birthday, I woke up and I started feeling ill. The week before, I had been training because I was a martial artist, and it was a fantastic uh, week, and I had a really good time. But I woke up that day, and I started feeling very ill, and it came out of nowhere. So I ran to the toilet, and I just started throwing up and throwing up, and again, throwing up. Basically, I coughed up an entire lung or an organ or something. It was insane. I'd never done that at that intensity before. So, you know what? I thought, okay, maybe I'd eaten something uh, the day before. And during my little birthday party, I, I stopped training for a day. And I decided to eat some stuff, you know, celebrate, take a day off. So I thought maybe something in that, you know, it was outside of my normal diet. So maybe in there was something that was causing this. So I thought, you know, okay, let me get the water. Let me get the soup. Let me get the accoutrements to prepare myself because I knew maybe I'd be going through about... 24 or so hours of this, you know, so I prepared myself, got all that ready. And then right after I had prepared all that, once again, it hit me, went right back to the bathroom, threw up again, same experience. But at the end of that experience, I started, I was running out of things to purge. I started dry heaving. So I thought, okay, I got to get some water down me like usual. So I started doing that. But the funny part about this, this is where it started getting a little bit different and where I should probably have seen a, a little bit of a, a clue that it was different, is that when I drank the water, it came straight up. Nothing was going down me. So the soup, the water, none of that would stay in me. So what happened is I kept throwing up every two hours. I was running to the bathroom. And then eventually, because I ran out of stuff, basically I just kept a bucket next to me that I would dry heave in and a little spittle would come out. It was intense, but I was still not able to absorb anything. Nothing could go down my throat. It would just come up immediately. So cut to four days later. This is Wednesday now. And I've been doing this consistently, not being able to sleep, not being able to drink any water, eat anything. And I'd been doing this consistently. And by now, instead of coughing up anything in my stomach, I was starting to cough up bile-like things. Uh, it, it's like this yellowish liquid, and I was starting to worry. The other thing that really made me worry was I started cramping in every part of my body. You know the Charlie horse you get when you uh, wake up? It's terrible, painful. Well, I was getting that in all parts of my body, and I was weak. I couldn't get up. I was dehydrated. And I was freaking out. At this point, I basically looked like I had some neurological disease, that I couldn't move. I had a hard time, hard time speaking. I was basically in fetal position. I couldn't eat or drink anything. So this is when I got really worried because it had lasted five or four days. And I'm basically at the end of the fourth day. And I'm thinking, I got to go to the hospital. This is some weird, virulent disease that I don't know about. But I still think I have some sort of stomach issue, so I'm not too worried. I think, you know what, I'm going to go to the doctor. They're going to give me a pill. I'm going to get better, and then I'm going to leave, going to go back to my regular life, going to start training again, all that kind of stuff. So I call my parents. They rush me to the hospital. I go to UCLA in California. And at UCLA, they, you know, they admit me, they do the whole deal. And once they get me in, right, and that's a whole process, once they get me in, they sit me down, they still think I have some sort of stomach flu, but some sort of weird stomach flu, because usually you can ingest something. So they sit me down, they take my blood, so everything is still normal. I still think that I'm going to get some sort of treatment, like an antibiotic, something like that. So... This is when things start to get a little bit weird up until this point. Outside of my room, I start seeing this kind of rustling, people running back and forth, kind of like on ER or one of the doctor shows, is that they're running here, running there. They're, get, uh, they're all talking about stats, this, stat, that. And I think, well, somebody must have like a gunshot wound or uh, maybe a heart attack, and they're really in there. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm probably going to wait a little bit because, you know, an emergency is coming before me. So, 
as I'm thinking this, they descend on the door of my little room, and they bring in a gurney, and they throw me on the gurney, and then they start plugging, plugging tubes into me, and they start giving me injections, taking blood, and I'm just, I'm like, what's going on? They take me in the ICU, which is the intensive care unit. It's where all the serious people are. And they put me in, and they come over to me, and they start doing stuff and hooking up monitors and everything. I swear, I, I felt like some sort of Frankenstein person hooked up to all this stuff. And I was going, whoa, 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 slow down. What do I have, and what's going on? And one of the doctors comes up to me and says, young man, you have kidney failure. I'm going, ho, 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 you got, you got the wrong dude. I'm the healthy dude. No, 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 that, that's wrong. He says, no, we've checked your blood three times. Your kidneys are not working. In fact, the stats that you came in with, one of those stats normally kills somebody. You had five of them. In fact, your blood is almost like acid. We need to get you into dialysis right now, immediately emergency dialysis. We gotta cut you open, put something into one of your veins, get your blood out and put it into dialysis. I said, whoa, 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 are you sure? Maybe there's just like a pill for this. Maybe you could just, you could just give me something and it would go away. They go, look, the kind of renal failure, kidney failure you have, it just doesn't go away. You have to clean your blood. You have to clean it. So we got to send you there. So this is what happens. They send me. They do the incision. They do an operation right then and there with local anesthesia, right then in the ICU, cut open a hole in my leg, put this like, it looks like a big old hose that basically like what you put in your gas tank. And they hook that up, sew it up, and send me into the dialysis area. Nobody there. It's like dead, dark room and there's all these machines lined up with chairs. They put me in one of the chairs, and a nurse comes by, hooks me up, and there's this kind of k-k-k-k-k-k-k-k-k-k sound. As I see my red blood come out of that hose into this, which looks like a some sort of gasket, and out through the gasket and back into the hose. Once again, I get massively ill. I start throwing up. All the fluids they gave me in the ICU, they come out. Everything goes wacko. I start running a fever. They come over and say, you know what? Your first dialysis, this is what usually happens. I say, well, this kind of sucks. This makes me feel worse than I was before. They said, no, this is going to help you out. So, you know, of course, at the time, I thought the doctors really knew what they were talking about. So I, I did what they told me and got it done. It took about four hours on that machine. It, not comfortable at all. The cramping came back really terribly because it takes out water, too. So they send me back to my room and they say, look, because of this, you're going to be able to sleep a little bit better tonight because I hadn't slept for that entire period of four days. And so eventually I did fall into kind of what you could consider a sleep coma. But I was woken up about four hours later by the nurse coming and taking blood. Boom. And I was in this, these sweats. I had night sweats. So I woke up and said, uh, can I talk to somebody about what's going on? I need to hear somebody. And they said, okay, I'll send you in, a, uh, in a, a social worker. She'll help you out. She'll explain some of this stuff. And then we'll talk to the dietitian. I go, okay, but I don't need a dietitian. I'm pretty healthy. She goes, okay, but oh, we'll send them in anyways. It's strange how the people at the hospital, they, they kind of, they're kind of like stewardesses. They, they nod and smile at you, but they just kind of don't hear anything that you say. And so later in, this person comes in who has a very different demeanor about her. She's uh, very soft, very uh, kind of, she almost has a motherly kind of feel to her. And she comes in, walks into the room, and she sits down, which none of them had done that before holds my hand, which now I'm going, whoa, this is the greatest doctor so far I've seen, because they're all, they all seemed like um, automatons. She says, how are you doing? First time somebody actually asked me that, that wasn't the question of, uh, what is your pain like from zero to, zero to ten? Zero being nothing, ten being excruciating. First time somebody actually asked me how I was doing. I told her, well, you know what, I'm not doing so well, and I'm kind of confused. I feel like crap, and, and I don't know what's going on. You know, last week I was doing great. I was exercising at a high level. I was competing with Olympic-style athletes. I was training in martial arts. 
I, I don't know what's going on. This happened over four days, but it just hit me. I don't know what's going on. Somebody needs to answer some questions for me. She says, well, you know what? I can, I'll try and help you out. I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. And so she s sits down. But before that, we need to, I need to help you basically adjust to your new lifestyle. And I go, well, what are you talking about, new lifestyle? Well, the diagnosis that you have, it's called end-stage renal disease. Well, the word in that that I really keyed on to was the end part. I went, well, what, what does that mean? It means that you're going to have to change some of the things because there's a certain therapy you're going to have to kind of embrace for the rest of your life. I said, well, what are you talking about? Well, then that's when she takes out her binder. It's a nice little binder. And takes out a, a, a piece of paper that says all of these things. And she gives me this piece of paper. And she starts going over a spiel, which kind of sounds a little rehearsed. You kind of know that she's done this before. So she starts explaining to you, well, the adjustments you're going to have to make is one, a dietary adjustment, uh, which means uh, some of the foods that you've put down is that you eat very commonly, you're not going to be able to eat most of those, such as the uh, vegetables, the fruits, some of these whole grains and things like that. I go, well, that's kind of the majority of my diet when I'm training. Well, you know what? The, the, the things you can't eat are on that piece of paper. And when I look at the piece of paper, it says basically white bread, white flour, um, a lot of meat, lots of meat, and the juices that I can ingest are basically fake juices like uh, Gatorade, but very little of that. Um, tang is a big one. They love the tang. And Kool-Aid instead of fruit juice. And this is basically my diet for the rest of my life. I'm going, oh, well, that kind of sucks. That's going to prevent me from doing a lot of the things that I want to do. It's going to be hard to train on that kind of diet. And uh, she says, well, you're probably not going to be able to train anymore doing that martial arts thing, because I heard you're a martial artist. And she says, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. You're going to have to uh, adjust that and maybe take something up that's a little bit more low impact. I go, well, what do you mean? Well. You're probably going to have to take a desk job or something, something that's not so active because one of the side effects of what you're going through is anemia, and that tends to cause a little depression and a little bed rest, and so you're not going to have the energy you used to. Well, what kind of percentage, I asked her. Well, about half, maybe a third of the energy. I went, well, that kind of sucks. Oh, by the way, some of the other things that you're at risk for are heart problems like heart attacks, arteriosclerosis, um, deaf, you could go deaf, blind, also there's a certain thing that's called neuropathy. Basically your hands and feet go numb and they become like, a, they become like paralyzed. So you won't be able to do any kind of dexterous moves. Um, also, uh, there's one last thing, there's a thing that happens to your brain. We're going to try and prevent that with some of the dialysis, but uh, you get this thing called ure uremic psychosis. And what that really means is you go crazy. And, uh, oh, you, get to do you have to do dialysis three times a week, like I did last night, for about four hours. And that usually takes a lot out of you, too. And that cramping thing, that'll be with you for the rest of your life. And then, you know, she went, so do you understand kind of what I'm talking about? And she actually had me sign a paper saying, I understand, kind of like I was signing a, a, a contract for a website or something like that. And she goes, look, if you have any more questions about what's going on, you know, ask, ask them to call me and I'll come in. And so she gets up, touches my hand very softly again, moves out and says, oh, and, you know, have a nice day, and leaves. <laughs> so this is when kind of the anvil hit me on the head. This is when I re it really kind of, the bottom fell out of my bottom. When it really hit me that, oh, my God, I'm here and all the things I thought I was, all the things I thought I would do, they just were ripped away in about 24 hours of experience. Gone. No more martial arts. No more physical activity. No more of my self-image of being the active, healthy guy. You're done with that. I am now the invalid. I am the person, the sick person. I'm the person who can't do anything instead of the person who can. And 
By the way, when I did some more research after this, I found out, you know that rest of your life comment she made? Happens to be five to seven years, which really took the piss out of me then. And I'm only 26. Four days ago, or five now, I just turned 26. So far, my entire life had been just eradicated like an atomic bomb to my future. Gone. And I was stuck with this feeble body that couldn't do anything. And then apparently I'm going to go crazy too, so I'm not going to be able to figure out anything. So this is really actually when all this starts, when this journey really begins. That kind of was the precursor. That was the ass kicking it took me to get to the point of emerging. Because that was the bottom. And the great gift that I now see that happened there was because I was stripped of everything, because nothing was left, the only thing that I could see, I was forced to see, was myself. And in that realization came these awarenesses, awareness of self, awareness of what was actually going on, instead of all of these distractions that I'd put up in my life that I didn't even know were distractions until they were gone. So what that allowed me to do, it actually allowed me to see myself in a way that I couldn't see myself before, but in a better way, a, a way that was more powerful, more empowering. And so in the next two weeks, I was in the hospital for the next two weeks. I can't, I just, all I could do was lie there because basically I was an invalid. I couldn't do anything. I basically had to have somebody roll me over. I had to have somebody help me pee. I had to... People were changing my bedpans. They were doing all this kind of stuff for me. So all I could do was lay there. It was almost like a forced self-analyzing meditation. And this meditation, in these two weeks, I came up with many of these awarenesses, these epiphanies, and epiphanies of consciousness. And so realistically, this show, what I'm going to be doing here, is going to be trying to share this with you. These epiphanies, these realizations, these, these higher states of consciousness, or even the concepts of lower states of consciousness. The things I discovered in the hospital, and subsequently after I got out, that basically grew from that experience, that low. And that's what I'm going to be giving away in this show. Love more life, right? I'm going to be trying to give away and have you those experience, get you to get to these places that I've gotten to without the ass kicking. Because what I found out is I did it the hardest way possible, where I had to almost die. And by the way, after the two weeks in the hospital, it didn't end there. The adventure kept going. We're talking about 13 near-death experiences where I almost died severely. And through these experiences, I came to some realizations. And these realizations is what this show is really about. And the key point is, I want you to do it the easy way instead of the hard way. So that's what I want you to join me with. On uh, every one of these shows, I'm going to be bringing up something that I've discovered or that I've bumped into on my journey that somebody else has discovered, that I've absorbed, that has taught me, right? and that hopefully can teach you something and that you can get out of this show. So that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, I hope you can join me. Uh, remember, a lot of this stuff is written down at my blog at unreasonablehappinessonline.com. That's unreasonablehappinessonline.com. You can go there and see a lot of this material and it coalesces a lot of the stuff and where I got it from. Also, you can always come here for, I'm going to try and do this weekly, if not uh, twice a week, at lovemorelife.com. That's the channel. Come here, and it's very easy to find. I'm Sifu Marcus Lovemore. This is Love More Life. Love to see you again.